Yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, in particular Andrea, for inviting me to present at this very nice workshop. Like Eduardo, it would have been wonderful to attend in person, uh, hopefully uh, some other time. Uh, and likewise, I've enjoyed very much uh, the talks that I've been able to, um, to uh, attend remotely. Um, and so the work mm -hmm. I will be uh, talking about today was done in collaboration with uh, Stephen Ryan, so who is a a mathematician, uh, an algebraic geometer in the, in, the, in the neighboring province of Saskatchewan at the University of Saskatchewan. And their work is uh, presented uh, in these two papers. So the first was published in Science Advances a couple of weeks ago, about a week and a half ago. And then the second uh, um, paper is a preprint uh, that we posted earlier uh, in August of this year. Okay, so the, the initial motivation for the work was this uh, nice experiment by Alicia Kolar and collaborators uh, published in Nature in 2019, where they fabricated this uh, structure. So it's a network of the microwave resonators and then photons are propagating on this structure. And if you sort of abstract away all the details, essentially what this is uh, described by is a tight binding model of photons hopping on some graph. Okay, so each of the dots represents a, uh, a wave, wave guy resonator with a particular resonant frequency omega naught that corresponds to some on-site energy. Um, and then there is a nearest neighbor um, uh, hopping amplitude uh, T between these sites. And then these A's are uh, creation and annihilation operators for non-interacting photons on this graph. Okay, so what's special about this structure? So as they explain uh, in the paper, you can view this uh, finite graph as a portion of an otherwise infinite hyperbolic lattice. So with the hyperbolic lattice, it's a, it's a lattice, it's a structure that is periodic, but not in Euclidean space as we have for regular uh, crystals, but uh, in hyperbolic space, okay? So what's hyperbolic space? So it's a, it's a space that shows up in various area, areas of physics. For example, uh, anti sitter space is an example of uh, hyperbolic space and the ADS-CFT correspondence. So hyperbolic space is a space of uniform negative curvature. Again, it also underlies the uh, so two-dimensional hyperbolic space, which is the, the case I'll be focused on in this talk, also underlies you know, the geometry of these uh, engravings by Escher. So I said that, uh, that uh, these are lattices, so that means that there's a notion of periodicity, but that's not obvious if you look at the structure, uh, which is made of uh, triangles and heptagons, because if you look at, for example, the heptagon in the middle and a heptagon near the boundary of this circle, then the heptagon in the middle is clearly bigger than the one in the boundary. Okay, and so uh, they look different, so it doesn't look periodic, but actually if you compare these two heptagons under the correct metric for the space, which is the so-called Poincare metric, and I'll get back to that a little bit later, then in fact, these two heptagons are exactly identical. Again, and same thing for, for the triangles. So in fact, all the, uh, the heptagons in the structure are all the same, all the triangles are the same, and it is in that sense that this uh, structure is periodic. So it's periodic, but in the non-Euclidean sense. Um, so there was this uh, first experiment. And then uh, earlier this week, we heard about uh, this very nice work by Titus and the collaborators where they fabricated uh, using uh, a classical uh, circuit technology, uh, another uh, hyperbolic class. So another finite portion, again, of an otherwise infinite uh, structure. So in this case, one is sort of uh, assimilating the quantum problem with the classical circuit. And it showed us how uh, there's uh, nice signatures of, of the negative curvature of the space in the wave propagation. For example, uh, if you look at the propagation of the signal that is uh, initiated near the boundary of this circle, then the wave fronts are not these kind of, uh, you know, distorted uh, plane wave fronts or kind of spherical wave fronts. They're rather these so-called horror cycles that are the wave fronts uh, in the hyperbolic geometry. Um, okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Let me go back to the, the first experiment for a second. So not only did they fabricate the structure, but they also took some measurements. In particular, they measured the transmission spectrum uh, for photons through this device. So they in inject a photon here, let's say, and then they collect it on this other side. And then they see what is the transmission amplitude as a function of frequency of the photon. And, uh, and then they attempt to model this transmission spectrum theoretically. So since we're dealing with a tight binding, a non-interacting tight binding model, you might say, well, uh, you know, we can just uh, do block theory, we can compute the vent structure, uh, the block wave functions, and then from that, maybe we can compute the, uh, the spectrum. Um, but as they point out in this, uh, in this paper, it's not obvious how to do this because 
there's no obvious uh, hyperbolic version of, uh, of log theory. And therefore, we wouldn't even really know how to proceed. So let's say define a crystal momentum and compute event structure. And from that, you know, compute a transmission. And if I can you know this, uh, this uh, sort of energy spectrum here, it's not really, it's not a band structure because uh, they're plotting the energy versus uh, eigenvector index. So they're not plotting them versus a, uh, a, quantum, a momentum quantum number. They're just sorting all the eigenvalues in increasing order as uh, you know, obtained by brute force diagonalization as you would do if you had a disordered system, for example. Okay. Um, and so in this talk, uh, I would like to convince you that, uh, or to argue that there is in fact a natural way of defining a crystal momentum for these hyperbolic lattices, uh, also construct the block eigenstates. And that overarching framework is what we call hyperbolic band theory. Okay, so this is the outline of the rest of the talk. So first I'll give a very brief review of Euclidean band theory focusing on the notions that we will try to generalize to, uh, to the hyperbolic case. Then I'll review a few basic concepts of hyperbolic geometry that we'll be needing for discussion, in particular, the notion of a Fuchsian group, which uh, is a discrete group that will play the, the role of a, a lattice translation group for these hyperbolic lattices. And then I'll focus on a particular uh, choice of lattice uh, called the 8-8 lattice. Um, that will make our discussion uh, as simple as possible. Um, and then uh, I will uh, try to be a little bit more rigorous than I was in the first part. And uh, to do this, I will introduce a notion of the periodic boundary conditions. And then we will uh, sort of uh, show that we can prove in fact some rigorous uh, block theorems uh, for these lattices. And then uh, I will conclude. Okay, so let's begin with uh, what we all know and love, uh, lattices in Euclidean space. Um, so we can view these as a tessellations of Euclidean plane R2. So for simplicity, I will consider regular tessellations where we are uh, tiling R2 by uh, regular polygons. For example, here, squares of side length uh, unity. And then uh, in solid state physics, we're interested in, in looking at Hamiltonians defined on these lattices. So here I'll use this kind of continuum uh, picture, and later on I'll switch to a more kind of tight binding picture. Um, but the basic Hamiltonian is con is uh, consists of two parts. So there is a kinetic term that is essentially a Laplacian, and this uh, first term has the the full continuous symmetry of the underlying uh, Euclidean plane. And then we turn on a periodic potential that only has a discrete symmetry of the lattice. So namely, in this uh, super lattice case, it would be invariant under these elementary translations, Tx and Ty, by one unit in the uh, horizontal and vertical directions, and then all the compositions of these uh, translations that form the uh, lattice, the discrete lattice translation group. OK, so how do we solve this, uh, this uh, problem? How do we compute the wave functions? Well, in this case, we know that we have a block theory. And so we can simply solve the problem as follows. So the Hamiltonian is the same in every unit cell. So we can just solve it in one unit cell subject to this uh, twisted periodic boundary condition that we uh, call the block condition. OK, so namely, we require that the wave function pick up a phase factor of e to the ikx uh, or e to the iky as we translate uh, by one unit in the uh, horizontal or vertical directions, respectively. And this is a well-defined self-adjoint problem. We get a discrete set of uh, eigen solutions and real uh, eigen energies. And from the fact that the kx and ky uh, phases appear uh, in these complex exponentials, then we, we realize that they are periodic variables. Okay, they're periodic modulo 2 pi. And therefore, we, we real recognize the familiar fact that uh, this uh, so-called crystal momentum lives in a torus, which is uh, the well-known Brillouin zone in two dimensions. OK, so now there's, in fact, another torus lurking in this uh, system, but this time in, in real space. Okay that uh, essentially corresponds to a compactification of the unit cell. So uh, I said that uh, this square lattice is essentially a 2D tiling of the Euclidean planes. In other words, there's a group action of this uh, translation group Z squared on this uh, acting on this Euclidean plane. So in mathematics, whenever you have a space and a group action on this space, it's natural to take the quotient of this uh, space that's by the group action and uh, uh, see if we get a nice a nice space by uh, taking this quotient, OK? And so in this case, taking the quotient, we get, again, a two torus. But this time in real space, that can be understood as 
to impact define the, the unit cell under the action of these translations. Okay, in other words, if we identify size that are uh, identified that are paired together by the action of a unit translation, then we glue them together for both the horizontal and the vertical uh, translations, then we get this uh, compact torus. Okay? And in this extended picture, if you translate the electron, let's say, by one unit cell, by one unit, then in this compactified picture, it corresponds to going around the torus, uh, going around each of the, the non-contractible cycles of this torus. All right, so whenever we have a compact surface in real space, then uh, as we know, let's say for the, uh, from the theory of the quantum Hall effect, it's often interesting to try to thread fluxes through these uh, non-contractible uh, cycles of this, this surface. Okay, so in other words, what I can do is I can define a flat connection on this torus and then compute the holonomy of this flat connection along the two cycles of this torus. Okay, for example, uh, if I compute it along this uh, cycle C1, then I can call this Kx, compute it along this other cycle C2, I can call this uh, Ky. And this in fact are nothing but uh, the block, uh, the components of the block wave vector, the crystal momentum, because I can interpret uh, essentially these uh, quantities as very phases that are accumulated as the electron sort of slowly adiabatically traverses the unit cell, okay, going from one side to the next. And in doing so, it will go around the torus uh, uh, along one of these cycles and then pick up the appropriate phase factor. And so this, you know, ED the IKX, you can think of this as a very phase that is picked up as the electron goes around the cycles of this, um, this torus. And since fluxes are periodic modulo 2 pi, again, we uh, recover the fact that the Brillouin zone is a torus. Okay, so now let's uh, let's try to think about uh, hyperbolic lattices. So hyperbolic space is a fairly counterintuitive. It has all these interesting uh, features, um, and that comes from the fact, in part, that um, although it's two-dimensional, it cannot be embedded isometrically in R three in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Therefore, uh, it's sometimes a bit hard to um, get an intuition for it. But one of its interesting features can be explained as follows. So if you look at uh, polygons with straight sides in a hyperbolic space, meaning that their sides are uh, geodesics, uh, and if you look at the sum of the interior angles of a polygon, let's say with P sides, then the sum of these angles is strictly less than the value you would uh, obtain in Euclidean geometry, okay? which is uh, P minus two times pi for a polygon with P sides. For example, if you look at a hyperbolic triangle, then the sum of the angles is strictly less than 180 degrees. And in fact, you can even get a hyperbolic triangle whose sum of the angles is uh, is exactly zero. Okay, and uh, as a result, you know these polygons, if you will, are 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 kind of pointier in hyperbolic space, and and therefore we can pack more things in hyperbolic space, uh, roughly speaking, than we can in Euclidean space. And as a result, there uh, are many more, and in fact, there's an infinity of regular tilings of the hyperbolic plane, whereas there's only a finite number of regular tilings of the, uh, of the Euclidean plane, which are you know, the, uh, the square lattice, the triangular lattice, and the hexagonal lattice. For example, I can have a tiling where I have uh, uh, hexagons, uh, four of which meet at every point of this, of this graph, or triangles with coordination number uh, seven, or even octagons with the coordination number eight. Again, so in a sense, you know, hyperbolic crystallography is infinitely richer than a uh, Euclidean uh, crystallography. Um, and uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on this 8-8 uh, lattice, which as uh, we will see is kind of the, the simplest uh, example we can consider to illustrate our, our theory. Okay, so uh, essentially I've been um, passively assuming this uh, point array, this picture, uh, but I haven't really explained it yet. So I will, I will explain this now. So the basic idea is, as I said, we cannot isometrically embed the hyperbolic plane in R3. And therefore, we need to develop these mathematical models to represent the geometry of the hyperbolic plane. And there are different models that will uh, essentially focus on one feature or make explicit or manifest one of the features of this hyperbolic uh, space at the expense of others. Uh, but they're all mathematically equivalent. Okay, so in this case, we'll focus on the so-called Poincaré this model that also underlies the, uh, the geometry of the, the experiments that I, uh, that I mentioned earlier. What we do is we take the interior of the unit disk in the complex plane, but uh, not subject to the usual uh, flat Euclidean metric, but to the so-called Poincaré metric. 
which has this uh, factor here in the denominator such that when I get near the boundary of this disk, then essentially the metric blows up. Okay. Now the result, you know, the distances that we'll see are are bigger uh, uh, on the boundary than they appear as compared to the center of this disk. So just like for the Euclidean plane, this uh, uh, this space, first of all, is an infinite space. It's a non-compact space because if I were to integrate the entire area using this metric, I would see that it's infinite uh, for this entire disk. And furthermore, it has it's a homogeneous space. It has a an infinite uh, uh, well, it has a group of of rigid transformations, a group of isometries um, that uh, is the Euclidean group for the Euclidean plane. And now this is replaced by this uh, other non-compact group called PSL2R, or in this uh, the circular uh, this geometry PSU1 comma one. Okay, it's a group of unimodular pseudo unitary matrices that act as Mobius transformations on the, on the complex coordinate in this disk. Okay, so these are basically conformal transformations that preserve the angles of the geometry, but do not, they do not preserve Euclidean distance. Uh, what they do preserve is the Poincaré distance or hyperbolic distance. So whose precise form does not really uh, matter, but uh, the basic idea is that if I take, let's say two points and Z and Z prime, and then I apply the same uh, transformation, uh, gamma, so I rigidly you know, act on these uh, these two points by the same transformation, then let's say they will come here. And uh, again, even though the Euclidean distance uh, looks different, the hyperbolic distance uh, would be the same. Again, that is why, you know, all the octagons in this figure, although they appear very distorted near the boundary, they all have the same side lengths and all the angles and are the same and therefore they're all congruent. And this is really a periodic uh, structure. Okay, so that is the group of, of continuous transformations of the of the of the plane in the absence of the lattice. What we're interested in to uh, study, uh, uh, you know, uh, with binding uh, Hamiltonians or periodic uh, uh, potentials on this system is an analog of the discrete lattice translation group that we had for Euclidean lattices. Okay, so it turns out that uh, there is a very natural analog of these for hyperbolic uh, tessellations. Which are so-called Fuchsian group. Okay, so now they're going to be discrete subgroups of this group of continuous isometries. Um, and you might think that since you know this is a two-dimensional uh, tessellation, then there should be two generators of this group, just like we had, you know, Tx and Ty for the Euclidean lattice. But in fact, uh, with this 8a lattice, there are four independent generators uh, of this group. Again, for this uh, regular octagonal tessellation, we can find explicit expression for these generators in this sort of Mobius transformation uh, notation, such that if I act with all these generators and their inverses and I take products and compose all of these, uh, these translations, then I get, uh, I tile the entirety of the Poincare disk. Okay, and, and the reason I call these translations is that in essence, a translation is a transformation that does not have any fixed points unlike, for example, a reflection or a rotation. And indeed, uh, this group uh, uh, acts uh, uh, by these, uh, these transformations without uh, any fixed points. And the difference uh, is, that, is that now the group will be non-abelian, and this will have uh, interesting uh, ramifications, as we'll see later on. OK, so, uh, so now we have this continuous space, which is a hyperbolic plane. We have this uh, group of this uh, Fuchsian group of uh, discrete translations acting on it. And so we can again try to develop this picture of the compactified unit cell. Okay, so without the compactification of the unit cell, there's an octagon. Now, if we act with this group on this space and we take the quotient, uh, then it's, it's well known in, in, uh, in algebraic topology and algebraic geometry that this quotient, in fact, gives us a Riemann surface. Okay? We can also see that it's just purely topologically, if you identify uh, the sides that are, are paired together by these elementary generators, and we glue them together, then you will see even just topologically that you will get a, a surface with uh, two holes in this case, which is a genus two surface. But uh, in fact, even if you keep the geometry, then this is a it's a smooth uh, Riemann surface, which is a uh, with its complex structure and so on. Okay, um, but even if, if I just look at the uh, the topology. Now it's quite uh, uh, natural to generalize the construction we had in the Euclidean place, uh, Euclidean case. Namely, uh, we can try to thread fluxes through the cycles of this uh, this compacted by unit cell. Okay, so in the case of the the square lattice in the Euclidean case, we had two cycles, 
So we can only thread two components, uh, two fluxes that I associated with Kx and Ky. Now there's going to be four cycles. And so now there's going to be four independent fluxes. And these I take to be uh, the components of, uh, of a crystal momentum for these uh, lattices that I will define, that we'll call a hyperbolic crystal momentum. Again, they are, they are fluxes. So they're, they're periodic modulo two pi. Uh, here there are four components. In general, if I had a, a genus G surface, um, which would arise, for example, if I didn't consider the, uh, the A8 a tessellation, but a tessellation with a polygons with four G sides, then I would get a uh, uh, two G of these components. And so what I get at the end of the day is a higher dimensional torus. Okay, so one of the basic messages, if you will, of this talk is that uh, even though in real space, these structures are two dimensional, the K space that arises naturally is in fact a higher dimensional torus that a mathematician is called the Jacobian of, uh, of a Riemann surface. Sorry, sorry, jo uh, uh, Joseph, can I, can I yeah. ask something? So yeah. he, here, how many states are there in the, in the moment in space? So, so do you have the same number of states as the, as the hyperbolic real space? Or? So, right, so that's a good question. So if you want to count states, then you have to have a finite number of, of states. And so for now, I am looking at an infinite lattice, but, but the second half of the talk, I will focus explicitly on that question, looking at finite lattices and counting the number of states. Okay, thanks. Okay, but for now, what I have is a continuous uh, four-dimensional Brin zone. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, can so, I can I ask you a question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, so it, it seems to me that in order to do this construction, you need the the, the polygon of your uh, tessellation as a number of sides, which is multiple of four. Yes. Uh, but before you showed images where you have triangles or heptagons or the kind of things. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so the full problem for an arbitrary tessellation, uh, so I do not have a good answer to that, but we can go beyond the 4G, 4G case by recognizing that certain lattices uh, can be viewed as, if you will, a brevet lattice with a basis. Okay, so for example, the simplest situation is to consider the so-called 8-3 lattice. Okay, so if I had uh, octagons, but with coordination number three, it turns out that you can represent this as a lattice where the kind of brevet unit cell is an octagon, but then there's more sites inside of it. So there'll be a triangles inside this unit cell. And we could treat this with exactly the same a theory. So basically we would have the case space would take care of the brevet lattice structure, and that I would have a sub lattice structure that can be treated as a kind of finite dimensional of Bloch Hamiltonian. Okay, so to the extent that you can identify a, a brevet lattice structure that is of this uh, uh, sort of 4G, 4G tiling form, then everything goes through. The other thing I will say is that uh, sometimes the, uh, the identification, it, it looks like it doesn't work, but in fact, it does work. So the analog is, for example, if you look at the hexagonal lattice in the Euclidean case, right? So if you have a hexagon and then you, you, uh, you might say, okay, well, there's, uh, there are three different pairwise identifications, right? If I, if I glue the opposite sides of the hexagon. But of course, we know that there are only two independent translations in two dimensions. So the crystal momentum really uh, only has two independent directions. In other words, you, you might say, okay, I'm going to identify K1, K2, K3, but then you would find that K3 is linearly dependent on K1 and K2. And the same thing can happen here. So here, these four generators are, are, not, are independent. But you could consider a structure where the generators are not independent, in which case um, you, can, you can assign uh, linearly independent uh, wave vectors to the, the linearly independent generators. And then the other ones are, are just going to involve linear, linear combinations of these. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, may I ask a question? Uh, short question. Um, so we have a surface and uh, try to, uh, to put a, a, a kind of a grid. Right on the on the surface. If yes. um, curvature is positive, not hyperbolic but elliptic surfaces, yes. it's impossible, um, and there are some defects. Uh, ah, that's a good question. For example, it's... sphere will have some defects on the poles, depending on um, uh, charts. Charts. But do I do, do I understand correctly that I, I simply don't know that for hyperbolic geometry. It's possible. There is no defects, right? Locally, tangentially, it looks like uh, Euclidean space. 
which uh, a grid would be, say, um, rectangular, local. Is this exactly. Right? That's correct. Exactly. That's right. So basically, if you so what we'll see later on is that um, right. So for the, the hyperbolic plane is an infinite plane. So so this is a non-compact surface. But uh, as we'll see later on, um, if you want to tile a, a compact surface with a hyperbolic tiling, then generically what will happen is that the genus of the of that uh, surface will increase, um, and so you you will you will have no defects. On that, th this tiling will be locally uh, perfectly uniform. So you will have exactly the same coordination everywhere, uh, provided that the um, the genus of the uh, the big surface you're trying to put your tiling on increases. So I will talk to that. I will talk about that a little bit later. But on hyperbolic uh, surface, there is no such obstructions. No matter what well, genus, no matter what genus is. Uh, is right. right. That's correct. Yeah. So so. That's correct. So basically, there's no, there will be no defect. So in the spherical case, uh, you know, basically th there's a condition for these two numbers p and q to be to be realized, and and so the condition is that p minus two times q minus two, uh, it needs to be compared to four. So if it's equal to four, then I get the the, the only three Euclidean tilings. If it's less than four, I get basically tilings of the sphere. And again, there's only a finite number of these, which are basically the platonic solids. And if it's greater than four, there's an there's an infinite number of solutions to that equation, which are all these tilings, mm -hmm. um, and these are perfect tilings. There's no no defect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, can I go quickly back to Chenke's question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so even in this uh, continuous form, you can get the analog of the usual picture that you get. There, may, there are many bands, okay, in the continuum if you have Euclidean lattice. Yes, but the yes. number of states in each band is the same. That's correct, yeah. OK. Uh, is that still true here? And is there an analog of that? Yeah, that will still be true, because uh, once once we formulate the this block problem, uh, if I only look at this, uh, this case space picture, then it's the same, because in a sense, that's where I'm going next, because now we're going to formulate this block problem. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for, for this class of eigenstates, and I will come back to that later, and that will be the focus of the second half of the talk. Is that um, the problem? Is you know mathematically is the same. You you formulate the solve a joint problem, and then uh, you know in, in this continuum problem, you will get a discrete set of uh, eigenstates. You know for each if you fix k, then you get you know okay in this continuum picture you get an infinite uh, number of bands. Mm -hmm. um, but in this sort of um, you know if if I were to put only one tight binding site in this structure. Then I would get one band, absolutely. So there's you know there's sort of one band per unit cell picture uh, mm -hmm. for, for sites in the unit cell is absolutely the same. And is the area of the torus essentially tells you how many states you have? Is the analog of that? <laughs> uh, I mean the area of the oh in case space? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, if you normalize it, then yes, then you get you get this one basically. So um, it's the same. So the yeah, but the subtlety is that you know the group is not a billion, and so in fact there will be higher dimensional representations, and that I will be talking about the second half. Of the... All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the questions. Um, okay, so we have this uh, this uh, um, ability to thread these these fluxes in the Jacobian, and then we can formulate uh, a hyperbolic version of this block problem. Okay, and so um, to do this, I want to proceed by analogy with the Euclidean case. So I want to have a kinetic term and then a potential term. I want the kinetic term to have, again, the, the full symmetry of the continuous underlying space, which here is the, uh, the hyperbolic plane. So I'll pick a Laplacian, you know, the Laplacian operator appropriate to that space, which is the Laplace Beltrami operator for the point array disk, which is written here. And then I can pick any potential uh, that has only this discrete symmetry of the tessellation. Okay, And so with these two ingredients, then I have a well-defined uh, block problem, which I solve as follows. So once again, the Hamiltonian is the same in every unit cell. And so I can solve it in one unit cell subject to, again, twisted periodic boundary conditions. But now there are four such conditions because I have four generators and four pairs of boundary segments to identify. Um, and you can check that this is a, you know, it's a well-defined, it's a self-adjoint problem I get. <clears throat> real eigenvalues and a discrete set of 
eigenstates for each choice of, of key vector. And, um, and so functions that obey these kinds of uh, conditions are called automorphic functions uh, in mathematics. Okay, so an example of, of uh, automorphic function is a, a modular function, okay, where the, the Fuchsian group would not be this uh, sort of octagonal Fuchsian group, but it would be, let's say, the modular group PSL2Z, okay, which is another discrete subgroup of PSL2R or PSU1, comma 1. Uh, so it's a class of automorphic functions. Here I'm looking at a different class of automorphic functions uh, that are automorphic with respect to this other type of Fuchsian group. Okay, so that's why we call this, uh, this uh, the automorphic block condition. All right, so now we can look at uh, what, what this produces for us. So we need to choose a particular potential. The simplest one is to set the potential to zero. This would be the you know, hyperbolic analog of the kind, kind of uh, you know, empty lattice problem we, we, uh, we use in, in sort of introductory solid state physics where we, the potentially zero, but we still impose the periodicity at the level of the, the block condition. And what you find is exactly, uh, you know, looks very similar to standard band structures. You know, there's well-defined bands. There are uh, splitting of the genesis away from high symmetry points and so on to the difference that, uh, you know, this is a cut through a four dimensional momentum space, even though, okay, the, again, the real space is, uh, is two dimensional. I can uh, turn on a potential Sorry, before turning on a potential, I can look at wave functions. Uh, there, are, there are automorphic functions. Uh, and I can turn on a potential here. I consider a simple attractive uh, potential well, uh, uh, a circular well of a certain depth and radius. And uh, you know, I, I periodize that. I translate it throughout the entire lattice to make it periodic. And then you know, we get features like, uh, you know, again, partial splitting of the genesis, uh, et cetera. Okay, so um, so there's two issues that that I've, I've swept under the rug, but that have already been mentioned uh, in, in some questions. Uh, so I've I've definitely exhibited an infinite set of of, uh, of um, states that do solve the problem. So there are definitely eigenstates, um, but I have not shown that they form a complete set. Okay, so I have a, a block ansatz, if you will, but not yet a block theorem. And then the other question is, what about finite lattices? Okay, so an experiment, of course. Either in Alicia's experiment or, or in uh, Titus's experiment, we can only fabricate finite lattices, um, perhaps you know large lattices, but finite ones. And so we would like to understand whether this uh, sort of hyperbolic band theory can have anything to say about finite lattices. So I'll, I'll try to resolve these two issues simultaneously um, by considering periodic boundary conditions. Okay, in fact, and that is what we do in uh, conventional solid state physics. We uh, take a finite lattice, could be arbitrarily large, but a finite lattice with n sites, we impose periodic boundary conditions, we use the block ansatz, and then we can count all the states and see if we haven't missed uh, any. Okay, and that is what I will want to do here as well. So, um, so let's first review how this works out in the Euclidean case, and then we'll, we'll suitably generalize it. So let's look at the simplest example, so uh, in one dimension. So suppose I have a one-dimensional tight binding chain that's uh, initially infinite. And then I want to consider a finite chain within sites imposed periodic boundary conditions. So I, I, I curve it around, I glue it uh, back to itself. And that is a tantamount to imposing this uh, boundary condition on the wave function. We plug in the block ansatz. We uh, 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 find that it's a good ansatz, but the wave vector is discretized now. And so there are n distinct values of uh, allowed k points. And since we had n sites to start with, then clearly we know that these n block states form a complete set. OK, so now uh, in the hyperbolic case, it's the geometry is a little bit more complicated. So to suitably generalize, uh, it's useful to develop a, an algebraic perspective on this uh, a periodic amount of condition situation and also a topological perspective on this. OK, so let me explain what these two viewpoints are. So let's first look at the algebraic uh, viewpoint. Um, so we start with the infinite lattice, which has this uh, discrete but infinite translation group Z, the group of, of integers. And then imposing, uh, imposing periodic boundary conditions with n sites is tantamount to requiring that the wave function is, is invariant under a, uh, a, a translation by a subgroup of this original group, uh, group G, okay, which is translation by any multiple, uh, any integer multiple of capital N. Um, and uh, although uh, it's trivial here, 
uh, uh, this this uh, normal subgroup, the, the fact that this okay, this this group here, this subgroup is a normal subgroup of these. So that's trivial here because uh, this is an abelian group. Uh, but nonetheless, um, if I take the quotient of a group by a normal subgroup, I get another group, which in this case is the n. And physically, this factor group or this quotient group is the uh, the group of finite translations on this lattice. Okay, so I had an infinite lattice. Its invariance group was Z. Now this finite lattice with periodic boundary conditions, its finite translation group is uh, Zn, which is just a group of sort of clock rotations uh, on this circle. Um, and now again, we understand why we have uh, uh, NK points because these correspond to the N unitary irreducible representations of, of uh, the cyclic group Zn, which are just indexed by uh, the nth of roots of unity, which are simply our block phase factors uh, for the finite system. Okay, so that's the algebraic perspective in terms of groups and their their, uh, their quotients. Now there's a topological uh, viewpoint uh, using covering theory in algebraic topology. Okay, so this is looking at uh, the compactified unit cell and then covers of this compactified unit cell. So here what I, I uh, consider is um, this uh, lattice to be, uh, I start from the infinite real lines and then I quotient by this uh, discrete group of translations G, and then I get a circle, which would be interpreted as a compactification of the unit cell. Okay, it's like a little circle here. And in the context of covering theory, then this group here is the fundamental group of uh, this quotient uh, uh, surface, which is a compact, uh, compact curve in this case. Now, if I look at the, uh, this a cluster with insights, it, it is itself a circle, but it's a bigger circle, okay? And uh, formally, uh, what we say is that this bigger circle is a finite cover of this small circle, okay? So it's, a, it's an n-sheeted cover of the small circle because it is a quotient, again, of the infinite real line by a, by a smaller group, which is this uh, a group of, uh, of uh, periodic boundary conditions that I call GPBC and Z. And uh, so this can be uh, formally expressed here so uh, this uh, n-sheeted cover has a, a group of deck transformations, uh, Zn, which is, again, the quotient of these two fundamental groups, which, again, is our group of, um, of residual translations on the cluster. OK, so now armed with this algebraic perspective and this topological perspective, we can try to generalize these ideas to uh, hyperbolic lattices uh, to try to how how to define uh, a good notion of periodic mount conditions. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to consider not the infinite tessellation, but only a subset of the tessellation with n uh, unit cells, a finite number of octagons, subject to a condition on the wave function, namely that uh, the wave function is invariant under a subset of these uh, function uh, transformations. Okay, so since these, uh, this uh, group here was found to be a normal subgroup, then we will again ask for this uh, group of, uh, of uh, transformations that lead the wave function invariant will demand that it is a normal subgroup of the original group. And we'll see why that's a good idea a little bit later on. And furthermore, I demand that it's a group of, of a subgroup of finite index, which just means that this uh, cluster has a finite number of unit cells. OK, so that will be the algebraic definition. So look for normal subgroups a finite index in the original Fuchsian group. What's the, the topological perspective? Again, it's, it's uh, viewing this finite cluster as a finite uh, cover of the compactified unit cell. So here, the compactified unit cell, remember, is a, is a, a Riemann surface of higher genus. Uh, in, the, in this case here, it's a surface of genus, uh, genus 2. Let's consider a general genus G. And the, the uh, the cluster now will be a n-sheeted cover of this uh, this Riemann surface. Okay, so in the case of uh, of the one-dimensional Euclidean lattice, uh, it was simple; it was just a bigger circle. But now, what do we get uh, for this uh, this hyperbolic time? Okay, so maybe this will also uh, come back to Paul's question. Um, so, so what we get, in fact, can, can yeah. I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah, in, for sure. In the usual Euclidean case. I know that one does a calculation for a finite system, but one normally is interested in the thermodynamic limit. Yes. Okay. 
where the momentum space is actually a torus. Yes. Yeah? Or is, which is a, you know, it's a product of circles. So it's, it's a simple theory. Right, uh, right. Is that still true here? I mean, what uh, is there a, any caveat about, are there any caveats here about the thermodynamic one? Yes, yes, you'll see. So that's exactly what I'm trying to address. So I'm doing this sort of bit by bit, but that's exactly where I'm going. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Right, so our goal is basically to consider a finite clusters, but to keep n arbitrary, right? To make it as, as large as possible with the hope of taking the thermodynamic limit. Um, okay, so here I'm just trying to develop a, uh, an intuition for what this, uh, this uh, compactified uh, periodic uh, uh, cluster looks like. Um, so in the case of, for example, a, uh, a square lattice, then we know that the, uh, if I apply boundary condition, periodic boundary condition, then I just get a bigger torus, right? And that's what we do when we study, for example, you know, uh, lattice systems using uh, uh, exact diagonalization. Uh, however, in this higher genus case, what we will get is a, uh, is a surface uh, of higher genus whose genus grows with the size of the system. Okay. The reason is the following. So whenever you have a, uh, a, an n-sheeted cover of a topological space, then the Euler characteristic of the cover is n times the Euler characteristic of the space you're covering. So if you have a circle or a torus, then the Euler characteristic of the space you're covering is zero. And so the, the characteristic of the cover remains zero. So you just get a bigger circle or a bigger torus. Here, uh, because the Euler characteristic of the genus G surface or g greater than one is not zero, then uh, you get a higher genus surface. And in fact, you can compute the genus of that surface uh, and you see it grows with the size of the system. So this is the so-called riemann hurwitz formula. Um, and so one example uh, uh, would be here. Okay, so if you, uh, for example, had a, a cluster with uh, five uh, sites, five octagons, and then you try to glue it into a compact surface, what you will find is a, um, a genus uh, six surface, um, and it would be uh, basically the 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 deck group would be a, a group of order five, which here would be just z five, okay, which is just a sort of group of of uh, rotations by two pi over five of this uh, kind of starfish type uh, uh, structure, where uh, uh, the action of the z five will, for example, glue this circle here with that circle here, and then if you uh, see uh, uh, what this gives you on this this sort of leaf here, then you will see that you you get another handle, and that is how you get back the genus G, uh, genus two surface by taking the quotient. Okay, so these clusters now are bigger uh, are surfaces of higher and higher genus. Okay, so why did I consider uh, normal subgroups? So the reason is that it is a condition that allows us to preserve this uh, block on that. Okay, for which this block on that is is correct. But the very short uh, uh, proof. Um, so let me assume that I have wave functions that obey this automorphic uh, condition. And then I consider uh, psi of this particular argument. So using this block condition, then I factorize this, uh, this uh, factor here times the wave function. Now, chi, I take it to be any representation of my Fulton group. And therefore, there is a, there is a further factorization. Um, uh, but since we demanded that the wave function be invariant under these are periodic boundary conditions, then chi of gamma PVC is one. So this factor disappears, and then these chi's cancel out. I get the wave function back. But now for this left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side, it means that this group element here must again lie in this group that lies that leaves the wave function invariant. And therefore, uh, these elements uh, must precisely form a normal subgroup of gamma. Okay, so this normal subgroup condition is really the one that allows you to uh, preserve the, uh, the block condition. All right, so now, uh, so how do we construct these, these the subgroups? How do we construct these clusters? Well, in Euclidean case, it's very simple. You just take bigger and bigger tori or bigger and bigger circles. Here, it's a non-trivial mathematical problem because uh, uh, we need to enumerate these normal subgroups in a non-abelian group gamma, okay, which is not, uh, cannot be done analytically except for uh, very small indices. Fortunately, uh, there are computational group theory algorithms that allow us to enumerate uh, these subgroups up to a given index. Uh, these are fairly computationally intensive, for example, up to index 25. It takes about a week of, of computational time on a, on a single CPU machine. And that's why we considered uh, clusters of, of size 
uh, 25, up to 25, which is modest, but it's sufficient to illustrate uh, the basic features of the, of the general theory. Mm -hmm. uh, just a short question. Um, yes. <clears throat> um, I probably missed it. Uh, you assume no potential in this case, or there is some potential? There is a potential for, so for now. I'm just looking at the uh, how to construct a cluster, uh, just how to impose periodic boundary conditions, regardless of the potential, in a sense. Yes, yes, but I yes, assume yes, that I but, have a potential that has this discrete translation and symmetry. Yes, but but just want to <laughs> listen. Understand. In some previous slides, you assume some that there is some potential, some hole in the middle. Are you talking about this case or not? Yes, no. that's right. It, it would it would it would apply to an arbitrary. Uh, potential. The only difference is that initially I considered infinite lattices, but I could not prove that uh, my block states form a complete set. Now I'm trying to look at a finite lattice uh, with periodic boundary conditions uh, with the goal of being able to enumerate states and make sure that I haven't missed any states. Mm -hmm. But because if there is no potential, it's a purely geometric problem, right? It's probably, how does it call? Um, 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 Constructing of uh, holomorphic sections of uh, on the surface on the on the bundle um, holomorphic section of of a, on, of a bundle on the Riemann surface is right. Yes, exactly, and I, I will come back to that at the end. So, so this is precisely that will be the the structure that emerges uh, from this construction. Mm -hmm. That yeah. Um. Okay, right. So, so here, this is simply to say, if I have a, a cluster with, let's say, you know, n, 10, 15, 20 uh, uh, octagons, how do I uh, glue the boundary sites together to make sure that I have a, a, a cluster that obeys this, uh, this condition? Okay, so there are many different ways to do that. So this is an example. This is a cluster with n uh, or uh, nine octagons, so the central octagon and then eight neighboring octagons. Um, and then we have these boundary identifications. Okay, so you can see why it's a fairly complicated problem because you know uh, even for this uh, uh, sort of modest n site uh, nine site cluster, there's in fact 28. Uh, uh, well, there's uh, there's uh, 56 uh, sites on the boundary, and then there are um, uh, 28 uh, pairwise identification that need to be done. Okay, so this is one example of of identification that gives rise to a valid uh, choice of boundary condition. For example, I glue this side here with this side X uh, and so on. Okay, there's these various identifications. And this is just to say that uh, we can in fact, you know, uh, enumerate all these uh, valid identifications. Even though they're complicated, we have a systematic way of doing this. And the point of doing this is that now I can construct a hopping matrix on, on an arbitrary cluster. Okay, so for, uh, so I consider here a, the simplest uh, tight binding lattice I can consider. So there's going to be one site at the center of each octagon. For the sites that are on the inside of the cluster, it's very simple to, to see which ones are nearest neighbors, but then uh, to know which ones are nearest neighbors on the periodic cluster, then I need these boundary identifications. Okay, For this simple uh, nine site cluster, it's essentially all to all hopping on this cluster. But for bigger clusters, it's a, it's a more difficult problem. And we need our, uh, these group theory methods. Um, and there is a, a systematic way of determining which, uh, whether uh, a pair of sites on a cluster are in fact nearest neighbors. Okay, so one can look at, we can, one can ask whether uh, uh, the group element uh, G sub J, which uh, gets me to unit cell uh, J from uh, the center, lies in the same coset as element G sub I times uh, a nearest neighbor translation. Okay, so this is sort of how we construct these, uh, these Hamiltonians. Now, once we have these hopping Hamiltonians, we can essentially diagonalize them and, and see whether our block ansatz captures all the states. Okay. So before I show uh, these comparisons, um, let's just remember um, what is the structure of the problem. So we have this infinite uh, uh, Fuchsian group gamma of, of translations. On the cluster, there is a residual group of translations. That is this factor group okay, of the infinite group gamma modulo this subgroup of, of of periodic boundary conditions, if that is a finite group of order n. Okay, so now gamma and uh, gamma PBC are both non abelian groups. And uh, it's not obvious at all that this uh, translation group will be, uh, will be abelian. Like we do not expect it to be in general. However, 
The surprise was that for a large fraction of clusters, we find that this group is in fact abelian. Okay, even though the original group and, uh, and this uh, subgroup are both on abelian, the, the quotient is abelian. Okay, so as you can see here, as a function of the cluster size, uh, only for a certain number of cluster sizes uh, is this group not abelian. So for uh, system sizes for which the group is abelian, uh, we call these abelian clusters. And now, uh, because this residual group is abelian, then in fact, this block ansatz I mentioned earlier is exact. Okay. Um, and so we can show this explicitly. Uh, so we can diagonalize the hopping uh, Hamiltonian on the cluster by brute force using exact diagonalization. These are the red crosses. And then we can compute the, uh, uh, the results using this, uh, this block ansatz, and we find perfect agreement. Okay, so now, what we have is this uh, sort of four-dimensional tight binding band structure, but evaluated at a discrete set of points. Okay, so this is maybe coming back to Eduardo's question. So now in finite size, our Jacobian, our four-dimensional Bernoulli zone is discretized. Okay, and it's, it's increasingly finely discretized as we go to bigger and uh, bigger systems. Um, and in fact, so these abelian clusters, so there's, there's, uh, there's one cluster, they're, they're all essentially sub um, sets of, of an infinite abelian cluster, which is an infinite cover of, of this uh, genus two surface, um, such that the factor group is the first homology group of the Riemann surface, which is an abelian group. Okay. And then for this infinite cluster, which is still not the full lattice. Okay. So it's a subset of the infinite lattice. Uh, for this cluster, uh, we basically recover the uh, 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 a, a fully continuous uh, four-dimensional Bernoulli zone. And you can see how already for you know, n equals 24, we approximate the, um, the density of states here that I plotted of this infinite uh, abelian cluster. Sorry, question. What is interpretation of the non-abelian clusters? These are like defects? Yeah, that, that's why I'm going, that's exactly where I'm going next. So, so this for the abelian clusters. Now, uh, what we find is that indeed, uh, for some of the system sizes, we do find abelian clusters, um, and uh, but it's it's not an all or nothing. Okay, so for example, or even for uh, these uh, system size, for example, on 12, 16, 18, uh, some clusters remain abelian. Okay, um, but uh, indeed there are clusters for which this group is not abelian, and for for which we do not expect this block on that to to capture all the states in the spectrum. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about in the remaining uh, few minutes. Um, so essentially what, what happens is that in addition to, so we do have one dimensional irreducible representations in general that will obey this, uh, this uh, sort of um, simple generalization of, of uh, the block theorem where these, uh, these uh, representations here are U1 representations. These are just characters essentially. But in general, uh, we will have states that obey what we call a non-abelian block theorem. Okay, so meaning that we will have states living in the general multiplex that will mix under each other under translations. Okay, so instead of picking up only a block phase factor, you will pick up a block matrix that will mix different states under translations. Okay, so these are the non-abelian uh, representations. So we can we can check that explicitly. Um, so in fact, we can make uh, definite predictions about the spectrum um, in, in finite size. Okay, using the fact that in fact these um, these residual translation matrices belong to the so-called regular representation, and the nice thing about this is that we know precisely, provided that we know the irreps of the group, then we know exactly not only which irreps will appear, but what the multiplicity of these irreps is going to be. Okay, so an irrep of dimension r will appear r times in the spectrum. We can check this. Okay, so for example, we took one particular cluster of size twenty-four. Um, we can work out. Uh, the, the character table of its factor group, uh, which is of order 24, we find 12 uh, irreps. And then if we you know, brute force diagonalize the, the spectrum, then we can identify uh, which irreps uh, uh, show up. Okay, so all the blue states, if you will, they're one dimensional irreps and they live in the, the four dimensional Brillouin zone, which uh, we could call it say an abelian Brillouin zone. But, um, now we also have states living in two-dimensional irreps, 
which show up here. Okay, so they, they live in these two-dimensional degenerate multiplets. And there's additional degeneracies that come from uh, point group symmetries that uh, I won't have the time to talk about. But uh, the degeneracy enforced by translation symmetry is, is, uh, is manifest. Okay, so now this begs the question. So um, what we find is that the general structure is that uh, uh, a hyperbolic lattice in general is characterized not by a single a brillouin zone, which is already a non-standard. It's a hard dimensional torus. So this will parameterize the U1 representations, but there's also higher, if you will, higher rank brillouin zones or non-abelian brillouin zones, which characterize a space of reps of higher dimensions. Okay, so, um, so in rank one, we know what, what these, uh, this space is. It's, it's a Jacobian space, but what about uh, higher dimensional representations? Uh, just I have um, a question for previous slide with the picture. Yes, yes. yes. I see. Um, <clears throat> generally, this spectrum will depends on the moduli space, right, of your human surface. That's correct. That's correct. So yeah, here I, I, I have. You probably assume some particular moduli. Correct. So I have so I have this so-called Bolza surface, which is this very regular octagon, which corresponds to a particular point. In this moduli space that we're talking about, in fact, it's it's a it's kind of an extremal point in in the in this moduli space because it's a Riemann surface with uh, one of the largest uh, groups of automorphisms uh, because it, it it is very symmetric um, and but, absolutely absolutely yeah, correct. The spectrum yeah. depends on this. Yes, I understand. But but uh, generally, if you don't fix the moduli, uh, then it's a pretty sizable parameter space, right? Energy depends on, uh, I forgot how, three uh, G yeah, minus three, G minus three, three. parameters, yes. right? Exactly. Parameters, which you can generally move around. That's correct. That's and correct. This, this, and these levels will move as well. That's correct. So, so that would correspond to, to, to choosing a different lattice, right? So that is analogous to saying, well, I, I have a square lattice, but I can also look at a rectangular lattice. And then you're you're moving around in the moduli space of well of elliptic curves in this case right of, of tori. Um, right. So here it'd be the right. same thing. If you fix right. the geometry of the lattice, then you have fixed the the moduli parameters of the of the Riemann surface. Right. So if um, for example, if I assume torus uh, flat. Uh, um, uh, yes, by, by the way, does your surface, uh, is the surface of constant uh, negative curvature? Constant, yes, constant negative curvature, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if curvature, would curvature be zero a torus? Yes. Then uh, uh, I wouldn't assume uh, any interesting level crossing if I start to move these parameters, which an example which you suggest, rectangular to tilt it to parallelogram. I think but you if, would. Uh, but if uh, curvature is not, is negative, and is negative, is there any spectral crossing phenomena? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So, so, so we haven't studied the, the dependence of the spectrum on, on the moduli because, you know, we, we fixed a, a given, uh, uh, a given modulus. But what I expect is that there will be a different uh, set of degeneracies. So, for example, here, you know, there are degeneracies that are accidental from the point of view of, of looking at translations only. But, but as I was mentioning, this particular Riemann surface we're looking at has a, this very large a group of automorphisms, and therefore that means that there must be additional symmetries coming from from this regularity. Now, if you start distorting this octagon and you're moving away from this kind of symmetric point in the moduli space, then I would expect that. Uh, some of these degeneracies would would move away. For example, you know, degeneracy between seven and eight and nine. So these do not have to be at the same energy from the point of view of translations, but uh, they are probably uh, uh, they have to be at the same energy because of 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 the fact that you are at a very symmetric point of the moduli space. So if you if you move around, yes, presumably you will split some degeneracies. Uh, I, I, yeah, so probably there are level crossings and and certainly splittings of degeneracies. I'm sorry. Uh, it's about time um, for you to summarize the, the. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So this is my last slide here. So, um, right. So then, um, right. So the, the last question that we wanted to ask was, 
what is it, what is the space of what is the the, the analog of the the Jacobian? And now if we go to higher rank or, or higher dimensional representations, and so this is describing this more general mathematical framework of a so-called non-abelian Hodge theory. So it's essentially a correspondence between the three worlds: so the topological world, the smooth world, and the holomorphic world. So in our band theory, we're naturally led to this topological uh, world. So what do I mean is we're looking at the set of irreducible representations of this Fuchsian group gamma into UR, okay? The space of all possible R-dimensional irreps of this infinite group gamma. This group gamma is the fundamental group of a, Riemann, of, a, of a Riemann surface. And as such, it only carries topological information. Um, and so this is kind of a, a topological object in a sense. Now, if I put a smooth structure on my Riemann surface, then, uh, and I was kind of loosely re referring to this earlier, then I can define a, a flat connection on this Riemann surface. And then uh, the, uh, uh, so this is the statement of this so-called Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. The, uh, this space is, is, is uh, in one to one correspondence with the space of flat connections on this Riemann surface, modulo gauge equivalence. Okay, so that's a space that shows up in physics, for example, uh, you know, if you quantize Yang-Mills theory on, the, on a Riemann surface, this was done by Etienne and Bott, you get that the space of solutions is of, of ground states is given by this. Also, the this the space of uh, you know, if you canonically quantize Chern Simon's theory with UR gauge group on on a space of form, you know, sigma G times R, then uh, this the space of gauge configurations before quantization is is this space here of flat connections. And then finally, there is a correspondence uh, uh, shown by Narasimhan and Sashadri uh, between this uh, topological object and, and a holomorphic object. So this, I think, also goes back to what Paul was, was talking about. So now there's a moduli space of, of, of stable holomorphic vector bundles of rank R. And now uh, this is assuming that we put a complex structure on the Riemann surface. And so my understanding, which is limited, uh, uh, is that um, the advantage of this formulation is that you know, these topological and smooth objects are very difficult to, to calculate, but now we have the tools of, of complex geometry <coughs> and algebraic geometry, which allow uh, one to make statements about uh, what this moduli space is. Okay, so for example, well, we, we know uh, a few things. We know it, it's dimension, so it's a complex manifold whose complex dimension is given by this formula. And we can look at some examples we mentioned earlier. Okay, so in genus one, which is the case of, of Euclidean lattices, then uh, this uh, is a manifold of complex dimension one, which means a manifold of, of real dimension two. That's just the regular two-dimensional Brillouin zone. Now, if we look at, at the case we discussed, the hyperbolic case, uh, a, a genus uh, a G, let's say, but in rank, uh, in rank one, then we get uh, that this is a manifold of complex dimension G or real dimension two G. This is the Jacobian that I, that I talked about, which arbitrizes abelian representations. But then we can look at, uh, uh, cases beyond that. So this, for example, if I look at the case of genus two and rank two, then this would correspond to uh, these uh, two-dimensional irreps here that I've talked about. So we should think of these 2D irreps as points in this uh, moduli space here of vector bundles of rank two. And for this specific case, but uh, we know it's geometry fairly well. So it, it's fairly complicated. It's a bundle of CP3 fibers over the Jacobian and you can check that at least the dimension matches because so this is a space that is locally uh, CP3 cross uh, the Jacobian. So CP3 is three complex dimensional. The Jacobian is uh, is two complex dimensional. And so this is five complex dimensional. And if you said here, you know, G equals two and R equals two, you get, you know, four plus one equals five. In case you, you get the counting. But in general, uh, it's not... Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's 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 an open problem in mathematics to determine the, the precise geometry of these spaces for arbitrary rank and, and arbitrary genes. Okay, so I'm basically done. Uh, so just brief, to briefly summarize, so uh, uh, our construction was based on the fact that uh, hyperbolic lattices, at least a large subset of them, have a non-abelian discrete translation group, which is a function group of 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 uh, this tessellation. It's isomorphic to the fundamental group of a genus G surface, Riemann surface. Uh, we showed that uh, finite but arbitrarily large clusters uh, with periodic boundary conditions correspond to normal subgroups of this group gamma. And uh, as such, they admit a, a block condition. Um, we showed that the, the band theory, the case-based description is, 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 is uh, fairly rich. It's kind of a, uh, it's a generalization of the Euclidean case whereby
uh, not only we have a, a Brillouin zone that is hard dimensional, but we in fact have an infinite a set of Brillouin zones uh, that correspond to uh, moduli spaces of, of vector bundles on Riemann surfaces. Uh, uh, this is allows us to establish rigorous flux theorems, uh, at least in, in finite size, but for arbitrary large size. And the point group symmetries, I didn't get, get a chance to talk about them. And then finally, I just want to say that um, I think uh, Titus' talk was particularly inspiring to me because uh, uh, our hope would be to see if we can test some of these predictions by implementing periodic boundary conditions in an experiment. And so that would, that would correspond to gluing sites on the boundary of these clusters that we saw earlier. And, and I think this platform should be uh, a fairly, uh, 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 really suitable for this, uh, given that one can, in principle, uh, uh, you know, uh, attach things with wires, whereas this would be maybe hard to do using other platforms. Okay, so I'd like to uh, thank the funding agencies that made this work possible, and I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So, are there uh, any? I have, a, I have a question. I want to come back to this issue of the defects. Yeah. So for certain clusters, you only have a million uh, states and the representations, and the other there are other clusters you get some non-abelian ones. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so uh, do they have a represent? Uh, you understand uh, from the as you go from say from twenty four or whatever from, to the next one, uh, what kind of defects do they actually represent? Oh, defects. So why do you call them defects? Uh, well, this is what I asked you before. Can you think of these as defects? Oh, I see. So you... So the analogy that I have in mind, which is the wrong one, is the problem of tiling three-dimensional space with icosahedra, where you can, which you cannot do. You can yes. do that if you curve the space to space of positive curvature, or you can get some sparse, more sparse lattices, which have gigantic unit cells. I think last time I saw that they had thousands of sites in each unit cell. Actually, they're called Frank Casper faces. This goes back to some old work by David, David Nelson trying to look at icosahedral ordering glasses, for instance, and things of that sort. And so, in general, there will be disclination lines that will appear in that case, essentially, because you cannot actually, you're actually in the wrong, you're, you're in flat space and not in a curved space. Right. Because, so, I was wondering whether this is an analog of that problem. I don't think so, because there, there, there are no defects in these clusters. So, why? So, first of all, the, the, the clusters are made of octagons. No, I understand from a crystalline point of view, the lattice is uniform. The lattice is uniform. And so the coordination uniform. is 8 8 everywhere. And right. the unit cells, so it's not like putting a heptagon somewhere in, you know, in, a, in a cluster, but otherwise but, only. But on. can you think of these additional uh, degeneracies, if you wish, that you have yeah. as accidental degeneracies due to the wrong packing, <laughs> essentially, that you have? That for yeah, certain clusters, that they, they are. They are happier and they are all one dimensional representations only. And for others, they will be unavoidable to have some non abelian ones which are higher dimension irreps. Yeah. So, you know, I think of it the other way. I think of this, I think of these non abelian clusters, and I need to, you know, we don't have a good understanding. That's a zeroth order question, uh, answer. But I think of these, uh, these uh, particular system sizes as, or, you know, clusters that are non abelian as clusters that are kind of more more symmetrical in the sense that they, they admit certain non-abelian operations that would not be uh, feasible uh, otherwise. You know, in, in, the, in the sense that, for example, you know, when you take, when you do ED, you know, uh, for some lattice models and you look at various clusters, and if you take a very anisotropic cluster, then you're going to miss, you know, high symmetry points yes. in the Brillouin yeah. zone, right? So here, my thought is, you know, if, if you take an anisotropic cluster, then you're going to miss completely all the non-abelian Brillouin zone, so to speak. You exclude, you know, an infinite set of Brillouin zones. Whereas yes. if the cluster is more symmetrical, then you you admit some of these hard dim representations. So if anything, I would think that these clusters are somehow uh, they must have some some extra symmetry. Uh, so there's yeah. probably some maybe some point group symmetries or something like that. But this we need to make it more precise. <laughs>
Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, interrupt you, but I think uh, the public here is uh, rather exhausted after two <laughs> seminars, and uh, I'm very sorry, but... Uh, okay, okay, we have all been sitting down in the, here, too. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> right. That's getting late in Italy. I mean, if, I, I think hungry. we should, I should stop the, the end of the, the, the seminar, but you can keep going. I mean, I, I can leave the, the, the Zoom. Uh,